Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the fifth online meeting of the Reverie Housing for Youth Learning Community. We're so glad to have you all here today. Um, this is Mindy Mitchell from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. And um, to minimize background noise, all of our lines are going to be muted, except for speakers. Um, so Jen, I think you're going to handle that remotely. Um, and throughout the webinar, you can post your questions for presenters in the box on the right of your screen. So our agenda for today. Um, the previous webinars have focused on the three core components of rapid rehousing and primarily examined programmatic aspects of the intervention. So today we're going to take a broader look at rapid rehousing at a systems level. Um, we're excited to have presentations from two Washingtons, um, Washington, D.C. and King County, Washington, describing how both those communities are using or will be using rapid rehousing for youth as part of a systemic response that creates flow out of the homelessness system. So first, providing an overview of an analysis that was done for DC on the impact of rapid rehousing for youth on the homelessness system, we will hear from Joyce Probst McAlpine, Senior Associate at APT Associates. And from King County, Washington, we will hear from Samantha Weiss, Program Manager with All Home King County, which is the King County COC, and Margaret Woolley, Associate Consultant at MEM Consultants. We'll also wrap up the presentations with an overview of rapid rehousing as a systems approach to homelessness by our own Kay Mosher McDivitt, who is the Senior Technical Assistance Specialist with the Alliance's Capacity Building Team. The CAP team travels all around the country helping communities develop and refine systemic responses to all forms of homelessness. So she'll have lots of uh, good insights to provide us. Then we'll have a Q&A with our presenters. And again, you can post your questions throughout the webinar in the question box on the right of your screen. Um, I will also talk briefly about the application for uh, the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program from HUD and how youth rapid housing fits into the comprehensive community response that that demonstration is aiming to promote. And finally, I'll just go over really quickly uh, what we'll hopefully be doing for our final webinar in this learning community series. Um, I can't believe it's almost done, you guys. It's been almost six months that we've been working on this. OK, so as always, we just like to start off with thinking about the reason why we're here, um, why we developed this learning community. We want to improve our knowledge and understanding of youth rapid rehousing and use it to improve our systemic response to youth homelessness um, in our local communities and nationally. And it's that systemic aspect of rapid rehousing that we're going to be focusing on today. So to get us started, um, we're so happy to have Joyce Probst McAlpine from APT Associates here in DC to talk about the work they've been doing in helping to develop DC's systemic response to youth homelessness. Okay, Joyce, and now we're ready for you. Just let me know when you want me to forward the slides if I don't get it. Okay, thanks, Mindy. Um, well, hello, everybody. I'm glad to have a chance to participate in this uh, learning community and to talk about youth homelessness. It's a topic that uh, we at APT Associates are very interested in. We helped develop the toolkits that were released when the uh, Demo youth demonstration uh, grant was released and uh, we're actually participating in some research to try to identify best practices for youth. So um, just to give you a little background, I was the director of a COC in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio for eight years and uh, the youth provider in Dayton was uh, close, closely involved in all parts of our continuum um, and participated in the development of coordinated entry and um, as the system uh, developed more rapid rehousing, um, that that organization, you know, worked with us on trying to figure out rapid rehousing for youth. And it was, you know, a challenge uh, in terms of transitioning the model. So I think this is a really important way to help think through how to apply this program model to the youth population. So glad to be able to give you some thoughts from a system perspective. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start out my presentation with some high-level thoughts about, you know, how do you, how does youth homelessness impact current systems? Uh, what we're learning about uh, implementing a system response to youth homelessness, and this is really separate from any particular provider, but 
thinking about serving the group of um, both minor youth, although uh, often the responses to them are very different than um, the responses to 18 to 24 year olds who were served by both youth providers and non-youth providers in the system. Um, thinking about how rapid rehousing fits within that youth homelessness response and as we are all being encouraged by HUD and everyone else to see rapid rehousing as a more and more important program model, you know, what are the elements that need to be thought of from a systems point of view in rapid rehousing? And then um, why a system would want to do that, right? I mean, it isn't just that HUD wants it. There are reasons um, that a system would think that this is a, the right direction to go in. So, Mindy, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so first the system impact of the current system, setting aside whether or not rapid rehousing has been implemented for youth. So youth experience homelessness very differently. I'm sure this is really something you've talked about a lot. They're, they're transient, they're really in and out of the system more frequently than adults maybe. And um, they, you know, the existing programs, particularly when the youth are not being served by youth serving programs and in a lot of communities there just aren't enough resources for, in youth serving programs to serve all 18 to 24 year olds. Um, it means that they're in adult programs that are maybe not fully prepared to meet their needs or that the youth don't feel are adequate to meet their needs. So there's both, right? The program isn't really um, fitting right and the youth don't reject, it, don't, don't accept it and so um, it, the patterns of youth homelessness can look different than for adults and so it's harder to um, kind of serve them in the way that the system was set up because it's primarily oriented to adults. Um, also, because transitional housing has been the primary way to serve youth once they get, once they get out of shelter, um, that impacts the length of time homeless on the overall system level, right? That um, youth are seen as, you know, an important population for transitional housing and the length of stay for youth in transitional housing can be longer than other populations in transitional housing. And that matters more and more with system performance measures for COCs. So it's, it's something that systems need to think about is, you know, what is the impact of the program models being developed for a subpopulation on the overall performance of our system. Um, so youth need flexible programs, really, you know, there's um, a lot of maturation which involves, you know, trial and error and sometimes that means they need to move between programs or they need more than one housing opportunity or um, they need more supports because um, there's emerging uh, mental illness or some other issue that really uh, means that they need more resources than they've been getting. So um, not every program is going to be able to serve a youth through their entire time in the system and so you need to be able to have flexibility um, to meet their needs at different points of time. And that's really a system response, right? Not, no one program or organization may be able to do all of that. Um, without making the youth homeless again, right? Like in a coordinated entry system, we don't want to make people homeless again to access the level of services they, they need. So that requires coordination between programs at the system level. And then the last is that youth need involvement from a lot of other mainstream systems, right? This is a core part of that new demonstration project is uh, creating the community response um, that is goes way beyond the homeless system. And so um, organizations may establish a lot of relationships, but really um, to serve all of the youth who are, you know, in a homeless system but not always served by youth providers, they really the system needs to think about the relationships that need to be established to serve the 18 to 24 year olds that are um, experiencing homelessness. So, so that's kind of like where things are now and, and where systems need to be thinking um, about, uh, you know, youth homelessness. So um, if you could go to the next slide. So two really important, you know, youth or system responses to youth homelessness, right? These emerging system um, practices that need to be implemented, uh, particularly coordinated entry across all providers, right? Coordinated entry for youth, it, it in the framework looks the same as uh, coordinated entry for any population, but you know, really the the need to consider youth preferences is probably a lot higher. You know, they're, they're really the um, opportunity to give youth a voice in what um, programs they're going to be going into. Um, having the programs that are appropriate to their needs and choices and 
um, not just having them have to fit into the programs that already exist, but providing a, a broader range of opportunities to them. And then also having coordinated entry engage all these other partners, right, which um, may or may not be part of the coordinated entry practice for adults where um, a lot of times for adults the primary focus is to resolve the housing crisis and then there's referrals. But um, the referrals may be um, seen, you know, as something that happens after the housing is established and it's an uh, independent relationship from the homeless system. But really because youth are going to um, be engaged in the homeless system sometimes longer than adults, it, it, there needs to be a more ongoing coordinated partnership to meet their needs from these non-housing providers. So coordinated entry um, may look different and certainly the demonstration project is imagining that you know, you're going to have a lot of other partners at the table figuring out what uh, the coordinated entry process looks like. And the housing first approach for youth, I, you know, it isn't different, right? Housing first is housing first. It doesn't matter what the population is. But um, youth have their own uh, challenges in the development stage, that the developmental stages that they're at in terms of um, the behavior that they may exhibit and, and being willing to, you know, not have that behavior exclude them from entering a project or from, or make it that they are exited for project because of behavior. And I think that has been a struggle uh, is to try to figure out how to respond in a way that helps the youth learn from their behavior without having them be exited from the program. So, so I think, you know, this is where a system is really trying to put all of this in place and youth have um, specific challenges that systems need to understand um, and consider when they're implementing these different practices. If you could go on um, to the next slide. So, um, so thinking about rapid rehousing for youth in a system, you know, like what, what program elements would you really want in a rapid rehousing program? Um, you know, the program may uh, need to think about how to have roommates, which is um, not always something that rapid rehousing programs do, although it really is, you know, one of the ways that everybody makes housing affordable is to share the cost of housing. Um, think about what their youth appropriate locations are, the services such as trauma-informed care that you would really want to make available um, to youth that um, might not be built into a program that's primarily focused on adults, partnership with mainstream youth resources again. So that, you know, that is in thinking about designing the rapid rehousing program, some youth specific considerations. Um, Thinking about where youth might have, you know, experiences of um, uh, needing to move because of what happened in their housing, and it, it really that it's not working out, and they need to go to another housing location. Some programs um, have restrictions on how many security deposits you can pay or how much resources you can access for somebody. So, again, having coordination across programs so that you're maintaining the housing for the youth instead of making them homeless to access other housing resources is a consideration. You know, this is a housing first consideration and a coordinated entry mid-system consideration. And then the last is, as I said, sometimes uh, because youth are still developing that um, they may, as they're rapidly rehoused, you really, um, you know, determine that the level of services they need are beyond the scope of a rapid rehousing program, that there are, say, emerging mental health issues or other health or disability issues that require more support, and you want to have that um, coordination to be able to move them into the appropriate level of housing, which again is a system level um, uh, uh, coordination kind of access question. So, um, you know, in designing a rapid rehousing program, it would be important to be thinking about all of these as how do you set that up and how, how does the system encourage uh, rapid rehousing for youth to think about what's needed. So the last, um, the last slide, if you could go to the last slide in this section, uh, Mindy, is really about what's the impact of a rapid rehousing or, or rapid rehousing for youth on a system, right? So they, um, a couple slides ago I talked about, you know, how youth homelessness long, leads to longer length of stay if they're primarily served in transitional housing and they're in and out in different patterns. Um, 
of using the system and COCs, you know, they're, uh, they had to submit the first system performance measures in the summer. The next year of system performance measure as and tomorrow, right? This is the last day of the fiscal year is tomorrow. And so that means that um, that year two of system performance measures performance is done. And um, COCs really need to start thinking about what are they going to do to move their, to improve their performance because funding is going to be more and more dependent on their ability to demonstrate that they're improving performance in the way that the system performance measures are uh, recommending. And so um, programs like rapid rehousing that exit people to housing quickly and then provide services in housing reduce the length of time homeless. Youth are a population that HUD has been clear um, they consider appropriate for transitional housing. There's certainly no push to say that the only way to serve youth is rapid rehousing, but as a part of an entire system's response to 18 to 24 year olds experiencing homelessness, rapid rehousing is certainly one element of it. And so, you know, that is part of what a system would think about, and I'll show you in a minute what DC was thinking about in, in having a full set of resources to respond to youth homelessness. They also, um, in the system performance measures, want to increase exits to permanent housing, and rapid rehousing does that because it provides a mechanism to find and maintain housing. And reducing returns, and with this case management in housing, rapid rehousing really tries to help people um, stabilize in housing and develop a plan for maintaining that housing even after um, they've exited the program. And so that kind of support, especially for youth who might have a longer length of stay in rapid rehousing, which is a longer length of assistance but not a longer length of homelessness, really um, gives the opportunity to help them um, to be able to maintain their housing after the program ends. So, and another consideration from a system point of view is always about what's the funding pushing us towards. And if if the last NOFA that was just, um, you know, we just had the submission date of is any indication, the reallocation and bonus money projects that are available for youth are rapid rehousing projects. So, or is it new money in that process in recent NOFAs for other program types for youth? So, a uh, COC who wants to address the needs of their 18 to 24 year olds and they have they need to bring in new money for it will have to figure out how rapid rehousing can work and so um, you know it is a little bit like we want to do it and we've got to figure it out anyway if we want to apply for money for youth um, I think you know these kind of learning communities are where COCs and providers can start designing a program that they think will meet the needs of youth. Okay, so um, if you could go to the next slide. I am going to quickly go through a system modeling process that we as TA providers did with the DC Continuum of Care about a year ago. And um, I'm going to show you some slides from a presentation that was done last winter to the National Network for Youth. Um, and the, the charts have like um, an early version of the inventory that they determined they needed to fully meet the needs of all youth experiencing homelessness in DC in a year. Since that, the modeling has been updated, so I just want to be really cautious because I'm sharing with you something that's in development. The, uh, the strategic plan for youth is being drafted right now, so it's not public yet. And when it's released, the charts that you are seeing will still exist, but they'll be slightly revised to, um, you know, have updated assumptions. So um, for that reason, these slides are going to be taken out of the slide deck before this presentation is shared because I don't want to have um, slides for DC uh, floating around that don't really reflect where their final plan is. But we, um, APT Associates has a, uh, an approach to system modeling which is built on assumptions about the kinds of pathways that people need to be able to exit homelessness. And our model is um, building the inventory that a community would need to fully meet the needs of all people 
experiencing homelessness. And we already did this for DC in their adult system. And that plan is public. It's called Homeward DC. Um, you can find it on, you could just Google it and you can find that plan and you can see kind of a final plan for the family and adult system in DC. And then we did the youth plan the next year. And so very quickly, you know, we start out by working on program models of different kinds of programs that are needed to be able to, you know, meet the needs of um, the population who have a lot of different types of needs. Some people just need a little bit of assistance and they're able to exit homelessness and stabilize on their own. And other people are long-term homeless and need a lot of supports and engagement to be able to um, be successfully housed. This is not news. but we try to really intentionally think through what program models are needed um, to meet the needs of everybody and then think through the pathways. If you can go to the next slide, I think if we illustrate the pathways, is that right? Um, yeah, so this is this is the family system. I don't have a similar graphic for youth, but if you think about it, like in a system where it isn't just people entering whatever program they can find, but something that's organized, usually through community coordinated entry, there's an assessment point. It might be a centralized assessment. It might be at a diverse a set of access points, but but it's organized so that people come through their need their immediate safety needs are met in a family system that might be both an emergency shelter and transitional housing. And after they've been there for a little bit, they have a housing placement assessment that really looks at what's the next program that you need to be able to exit to housing successfully. And so you could imagine that there would be a family that came in and needed shelter and then they needed wrapper housing and then they were going to exit to permanent housing. But a youth family might um, come to shelter and then go to say transitional housing and then have rapid rehousing afterwards because they just needed that length of time of assistance and the transitional housing provided more support and the rapid rehousing provided a chance for independence but still with some supports. So there's different pathways for different people um, and uh, the assessment tools really try to help determine this. And even though we are planning and developing these pathways, I just want to be clear that this doesn't mean that um, like if 30% of uh, population needed rapid rehousing, every third person gets re rapid rehousing, right? It is still for an individual presenting um, for services, their, it, their unique situation determines what they get. So we are uh, planning for a population in a big picture way, but the service delivery is still on an individual basis, and the plan needs to be updated based on, you know, uh, assessment results over time. So if you could go to the next slide. So what we do, and here is an example at the bottom, this example um, of a pathway. So uh, in D.C., they estimated that 17% of youth would be identified through outreach. They would need to go to shelter for two months, and then they could go to a TLP, ILP program for 12 months, and then they would exit to permanent housing. And once we have identified all the pathways, and you can see in this picture that we um, used kind of a experiential activity to try to make this um, be more concrete and easier to think about. So each of these strips of tape going down the um, table is a different pathway. And a lot of them have what they call crisis beds um, as a first stop. And then people go to different things. Some people only need what in DC is called crisis beds, other places is called emergency shelter. Some youth only need that and they are able to reconcile with family and they exit back to family and that's their best destination. They might need some services afterwards um, to help support them there, but they're not going to get another program in the homeless system. And there was a sense like a lot of people that's what they needed in, the, in a youth homeless system is just the respite, the safe place to stay while they worked on the family relationship and then they could go back. But other people don't have that family relationship to access and they need, like the longest strip here is a crisis bed to a transitional TLP, ILP to a rapid rehousing program. And they need that layering of programs along a pathway to be able to exit to permanent housing successfully. 
and then we used 100 cents to try to say what percentage of all youth experiencing homelessness in a year need this particular pathway. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, you'll see the chart that we end up with is an in, uh, kind of a system utilization chart that has each pathway and um, it allows us, this is a big spreadsheet, so um, on the left hand side we have all these different service strategies or pathways and then under the overall strategy you can see the percentages and again this is a draft, it's not, it's not the final final report, but the estimated percentages of the youth population that need each pathway and then how long they're going to stay in months in each of the programs along the pathway. And after that, we are able to estimate an inventory at a point in time, how many crisis beds you would need, how many rapid rehousing slots. Um, and if you could go to the next chart, this chart shows you that inventory graphically over the five years of the plan where on the left-hand side there's the current system inventory, which is pretty small in DC. And then over time, as funding is increased, they are able to grow their inventory. And by year four, um, there would be enough inventory in the youth system to be able to meet the needs of the 800 youth that they expect. And um, they, I should have said, they're only modeling for single youth because families are such a huge part of their family population, the 18 to 24 year old head of households for families that they are going to really modify their family system to be a youth serving system and just serve all families together. So this, this, what you're looking at is the inventory that's expected to be needed to meet the needs of the 800 single youth that they um, are projecting um, experience homelessness each year. Um, and uh, and kind of so this is no longer a pathway. This is a type of bed or slot or service strategy that would um, uh, be needed to be in place so that you could have the option of exiting somebody from shelter when they were ready to exit. Because some people stay in shelter because there's nothing for them to go to, which increases their length of time homeless. It expands the number of shelter beds you need because the person that really was ready to go after one month is still there in the third month because whatever they needed next is not available. So as you expand the other um, resources in the system, you're able to either keep your shelter size smaller or reduce the amount of shelter you have. And that the blue line that um, is the only line that's really going down in this graph um, is adult shelter, which is now taking up the overflow in DC because you, there isn't enough youth um, shelter. And we're projecting in you know, on the first couple of years, it's still going to need to be an important service strategy because it takes a while to build this capacity. But in the end, the goal would be that youth, as long as they chose youth shelter, they, will, they could still access adult shelter. They are adults and they are eligible. But if they chose, there would be the availability in youth shelter to serve them all. So I think this is the chart, right, like the big picture, how do systems plan and what does rapid rehousing, obviously it's a big intervention, this gray bar that's going up to the top of the chart at the end is a, a major intervention for DC. It's got a fairly long length of stay because of the youth developmental needs, but the expectation is that they would be um, in their own housing with services in the housing. I think that's it. Oh. So there's one more slide if you want to go, Mindy. I hope I'm talking fast enough. <clears throat> so challenges in doing this, data is hard to get, the nature of the need, our understanding of the need is incomplete. We need more rea uh, coordinated entry da data. This is a, a complicated thing to do. It really requires leadership and skill. Implementation is very complicated and really doing that chart as complicated as a look is easy compared to the full implementation. <clears throat> um, youth have a lot of complex needs and so there, there are actually more pathways for youth than there are for adults, I think, because there's just anticipated to be more, um, 
more permutations of what they need. And then, um, you know, really we want to be respectful of client choice in this. And so um, there is uh, the challenge of, of making sure that you really uh, have the availability to respect client choice by also needing to plan a system. So I think that was it. I know you've got other presentations. I think I've already said all of this. Okay. So thank you, everybody. I think there's questions at the end. Yes, we'll do uh, Q&A at the end. And let me pull up. Sorry, folks. Um, for those of you uh, attending the webinar, usually I have um, my uh, colleague Jen here in the office with me, and she's working remotely today. So you know I'm not. Uh, technologically gifted, so this is taking me a little longer. Um, okay, so I think I'm ready. And thank you again, Joyce. Um, there really is so much exciting work happening in uh, DC right now around youth homelessness. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the continued progress that we make as uh, the DC COC moves forward. Um, next up, we have a presentation from another Washington across the country, the King County Washington folks. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, King County is where Seattle is located. Um, so first up, we will have uh, Samantha Weiss from All Home King County, which is, again, King County COC, and then Margaret Woolley from MEM Consultants, which will go over an analysis um, that they did of various youth property housing programs in King County. Um, let me make sure I have everybody. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, after uh, Margaret talks about uh, her analysis, Samantha is going to join us again um, to talk about lessons learned and next steps in King County. So I believe now we have um, Samantha, you're up. Yep, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so yeah, we can just go ahead and skip past this because that was the introduction I would have already given, so thank you. Um, we've been doing rapid rehousing programs in King County for a few years, and that's what you'll hear more about with Margaret's analysis. Um, and then we've also recently launched a new rapid rehousing program this summer, so I'll share details about kind of all of those programs with you, um, and then at the end we'll come back to data and learning circles. So rapid rehousing programs. Um, we've had a variety of program models operating. Some of them have had income requirements, both minimums and maximums. Um, for example, one program required that you had $1,200 a month in earned income or um, in income that you were able to spend towards rent, um, and then, but not more than 50% of the area median income. So what that ended up looking like was somewhere between $1,000 a month or $1,200 a month, and um, about $1,600 a month, so a fairly small window of income. Many of those programs also had criminal history restrictions. Um, they prevented uh, registered sex offenders, anyone who had a charge of production of methamphetamine and arson. Um, and there's also a pretty straightforward rental assistance subsidy and timeline. So for example, with that program um, that I mentioned, it would be rental assistance for 18 months and then an additional six months of case management following that um, if the participant chose to engage in that. Um, so those programs had a lot of successes. Um, they were highly sought after by young people in our community. And then it also led to young people saying, when we revised our comprehensive plan for ending, preventing and ending youth and young adult homelessness, it led to young people saying, we want more of that. And so we can go and uh, jump forward to the next slide. Um, and so we heard the young people saying that, and in response, we're able to launch with new funding from the McKinney COC dollars, um, a rapid rehousing program that launched just this past August. So this is a consortium of four agencies in our community. There's one case manager in each agency that is devoted to the rapid rehousing program, and we have a total of 64 units, so 16 um, young people per agency for each case manager. Um, so eligibility is fairly open. Um, basically, the only requirements are HUD definition of homeless, um, literally homeless, uh, sleeping outside, sleeping in a shelter, um, sleeping in a place not meant for human habitation. There's no income minimum or maximum. 
and there are no criminal background requirements. So as long as someone fits the um, living requirements, they would be eligible for this program should they want to um, participate in it. Um, the program model, uh, rental subsidy, is budgeted for one year of step-down assistance, but on the back side, and something we don't tell young people up front, is that we could potentially extend that to 24 months. Um, and then regardless of how long someone receives the rental subsidy for, they can also receive an additional six months of case management only. Um, so to help continue to stabilize, make sure that someone has resources and, and is able to maintain that housing. Um, there's also a one-time uh, kind of an emergency fund that while someone is just in that case management period, if they lose a job, if they don't have the means to pay rent for one of those months, they can receive an emergency subsidy payment while they're still engaged in that program. So there's no preconditions to housing. It's a housing first model. Um, the goal is to take someone as soon as they're referred and do whatever it takes to get them into a unit and then help work with them through progressive engagement to figure out how they can maintain that housing. One unique thing about this program that we found helpful for our um, local rental market, which is very challenging, um, is that we have a housing locator available at one of the agencies. And that housing locator is available to any of the case managers in the consortium. Um, and so when someone receives a referral, if they say, wow, this person has a lot of barriers, I think we're going to need to look at those resources that we've already identified as some uh, landlord who would might be able to work better with you or a unit that might um, you know, be able to step right up and, and meet the needs that you're presenting with. And the housing locator can help negotiate some of those relationships between case managers, young people, and landlords. Um, so the model is pretty consistent with national best practices and the findings and recommendations from Margaret's research. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Margaret, and you can hear more about what she found. Great. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, so yeah, next slide, Mindy. So uh, this retrospective. Thanks. So this retrospective analysis was um, done using HMIS data from the last actually about five years here in King County. As Samantha said, there was a number of programs that were, we'll say, rapid rehousing-ish. Um, variety of rental systems, structures, and um, case management models, but um, all with the idea of supporting young people in quickly finding housing in the open market uh, with some sort of rental assistance that would go away over time. So uh, next slide. So the key findings from the program implementation, as I said, um, uh, significant differences in um, the program structures. But um, since 2010, 235 households um, headed by young adults, really, and we can say pretty much just young adults, I think about five of them were families in the analysis, um, had enrolled in rapid rehousing specifically for young adults since 2010. Um, but of that 235, only 132 have actually gone through, sort of completed the, the rapid rehousing process um, from enrollment in the program to move into uh, housing within the rapid rehousing program and then exited. Um, we'll get into a couple of reasons for that uh, later as I'm talking. Um, it's great to note that the majority of young adults do move into housing in the rapid rehousing programs. Um, and that, but it is worth noting that here in King County, we have seen that um, at least 23% of clients we're exiting the rapid rehousing programs without ever moving into housing. So we'll talk about that a little bit more too. Next slide. So the next three slides are looking at how the programs here in King County performed in relation to the national benchmarks that um, have recently been released by NEH and other partners. Um, and so the first one, length of time homeless, is measured as the length of time between enrollment date in the rapid rehousing program and move-in date in the rapid rehousing program. Um, and it's important to note that actually the data for this was not available for 
one of the larger programs and then the majority of another program, that Youth Care Open Doors program, uh, the light green bar in the middle. Due to some data stuff that I'm not going to go into. <laughs> so, um, but what I think is interesting to, to note here um, is that there was really only one program that was meeting the national benchmark of 30 days or less, um, whereas other programs were taking a lot longer. But um, in some of the data that I'm not showing you, also that program that was meeting the benchmark was also having a much higher rate of exiting clients before they ever moved into housing. And so I think one of the things that I find most interesting about this is just as a system, how we think about what we measure, what, what gets measured gets, is what gets done. And so thinking about what is being incentivized. And while um, I think it is really important to incentivize and work towards really rapid rates of move in um, because that's, that's part of the goal of rapid rehousing and that we don't want people to experience homelessness any longer than they are. Um, it's worth thinking about how setting bars um, may incentivize different things like exiting clients from a program if they aren't able to move in quickly. And then what happens to them within the larger system. So something to think about with this piece of information. Uh, next slide. So related to that, um, this is looking at the permanent housing success rates. And the two different graphs are of the one on the left is of the clients who actually moved into a rapid rehousing, whereas the one on the right is clients who um, were never able to move into rapid rehousing but were exited. And you can see that the success rate for um, exit to a permanent destination was much higher for um, those clients who actually moved into a rapid rehousing program and were there generally for at least several months um, before moving on. So of those clients who move into housing in a rapid rehousing program, 81% of them exited to a permanent destination, which is across the board um, above the benchmark of 80%, whereas those who never moved into housing, um, only 17% uh, moved to a permanent destination. Many were unknown exit destinations. So next slide. And then oh, Excel and I have been having some battles. Sorry, you all got to see that. Um, so this, Mindy, can you go back? Um, so I can just explain this really quickly, though. Um, and this is returns to homelessness. Um, given the data that I had available for this analysis, I had to do it a little bit differently than how the benchmark is defined. But basically what we found, the dark green slice of the pie indicates that 7% of um, clients who exited to a permanent destination of the 100 that I could look at this for, um, only 7% of them returned to a housing or shelter program within a year. And then that light green slice of the pie is the 22% that showed up in the HMIS system again, accessing some other type of services or prevention. But what I didn't have at that time was, um, what I didn't have in the data set was their housing status at the time they accessed that program. So I don't know whether or not they were experiencing homelessness again. And the benchmark goal on this is that 85% um, of folks who exit to a permanent destination do not return to homelessness. And it's a little bit hard to say given the way I could look at this data, whether or not we're hitting that, but I do think it's worth noting that it was only 7% who returned to a housing or shelter program within a year. Um, so yeah, next slide. So some other notes on program outcomes. Um, one of the things that I looked at in particular was um, clients who were entering with no income um, because, you know, there's been, some perception in our community at least where, as Samantha said, we have a really tight rental market um, and an, a very high cost of living um, that clients without income could not succeed in rapid rehousing. Um, but I think what we did see in this analysis is that that's actually not the case. Um, so clients with a, longer, with a lower income, though, do on average take longer to move into housing. So, it was an average of almost three months for clients with no intake income to move in, um, whereas it was 
closer to two months for a client with over $1,000 in income at intake. Uh, and then uh, of those who move into housing, those with higher income are more likely to exit to permanent destinations. But that being said, even those who enrolled with no income, once they had moved into the program, 61% of them did exit to a permanent destination. Uh, one thing we did find in a, you know, worth thinking about with youth in young adult rapid rehousing, um, the, a longer length of time is correlated with more exits to permanent destinations. 93% uh, of those who stayed 19 to 24 months in the program exited to a permanent destination. Three quarters of those who stayed less than six months, though, also exited to a permanent destination. And then um, most young adults are continuing to rent on their own after they exit. 72% um, are continuing to rent with no subsidy. Um, but I do think it's interesting that another 18% are living with family or friends in a permanent situation. So, um, you know, they they were probably, you know, given the way most of these programs were structured, they were probably living on their own while they were in the rapid rehousing program, um, but decided at the end of that program that that wasn't a sustainable living situation for them and ended up moving in with family or friends in a permanent situation. So sort of thinking about, as I know Joyce brought up, what are the age-appropriate living situations for young people and um, how can we, in the rapid rehousing programs, help support that. So next slide. So last couple slides, just um, some high-level things. Um, I think the highest level finding out of this analysis was that rapid rehousing really can be a successful option for young adults. I know a lot of you are thinking that already, but there's always been some skepticism around it. And so part of this analysis was just um, making sure that that wasn't just a gut feeling, but that it, it appeared to be true using some data. Um, it may take longer for young adults coming from shelter or girl homelessness or without income to be able to find, to be successful in rapid rehousing. Um, finding housing can take longer for those clients. So thinking about how to structure your program to support them and what that does mean for your system metrics and how that's going to all balance out. Um, and then in the interest of time, we can move on. And I think all of these slides are going to get sent out later, right? So people can read yep. in more detail. Okay. Yep, they will be. Um, okay. But I think the challenge, you know, particularly thinking about this in the system context, as I was saying, is that young adults may need more support and more time to be successful. And so how do you take that into consideration when designing the programs and thinking about how they fit in your whole system? Um, I am curious to hear from a national audience. Um, whether or not other communities are having this experience of young adults who enroll in the rapid rehousing programs but were not successfully able to move in, um, given that we had at least a quarter of young adults in our community who had that experience. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any data about what happens to them afterwards, but um, definitely a group we're thinking more about. And I know Samantha um, is talking with service providers about how that group can be successful going forward and why they weren't successful uh, Mar Margaret, in the past. Can I, jump in, can I jump in just really quick here with a clarifying question? Yeah. Several people have, have posted this. When you're talking about mm -hmm. enrolling in a rapid rehousing program, you're not talking about mm -hmm. people getting into housing. What is there some other process that's happening before people are being actually housed that, that counts oh, as being yeah. enrolled in a rapid rehousing program? Yeah, so at least the way it works here in King County is that there's, um, so uh, that a young person or any person will become enrolled in a rapid rehousing program, which means they start working with a case manager um, to find housing. And so um, they may still be staying in a shelter at that time or living on the streets or you know, doing whatever it is they're figuring out how to do, being in their car, while finding housing. And so that's an initial date. So let's say, um, in particular in our community, all of these referrals happen through coordinated entry at this point. Um, and so 
So say a young person gets a referral to the Rapid Rehousing Program on January 15th, um, and that's their enrollment date. They start working with a case manager, and ideally, let's say on, let's be really optimistic, on February 1st, they're able, they've found an apartment, they signed a lease, and they're able to move in. And so that becomes their move-in date. And then they receive subsidy for a period of time, ideally. Um, and they stay in housing, and they get a job, and they, you know, everything's going well. And then they um, exit at some point. And they may exit and move to another living situation. They may stay in their um, living situation they were in while they were in the rapid rehousing program, uh, and um, or and pay rent on their own or some other type of situation. Does that help clarify it? Yes, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. No, I know there was some confusion about that here as well. So um, just out of the findings, I should say that in addition to looking at the HMIS data. I also did interviews with program staff at the Rapid Rehousing Programs, and so some of these recommendations come out of that kind of qualitative information that I gathered from them. And so just allowing for program flexibility to support young adults and their possibly different needs, um, setting expectations up front with clients so that they know what it is they're getting into, so they have the best opportunity to be successful. Uh, what kind of support is necessary for young adults who enter without employment or income. Um, I think this idea of alternative living arrangements, I know Joyce brought this up, and um, I think it's one that's being talked about here in King County as well, and then strengthening landlord relationships. So that is a really quick rundown on the analysis that I did, and I think now we go back to Samantha to talk about what's coming up next in King County. Great. Yeah, if we could go ahead and flip forward to the next slide there. So um, okay, there we go. this really just shows, thank you. Um, so we've got dashboards, of course, because we want to track everything and know how our intervention is working. Um, these are our draft rapid rehousing dashboards. We developed them about a year ago in great anticipation of the program that would come online. Um, and so we're working to finalize these now, add a couple of additional points on them. I know that they're small. They're really not meant to be dug into um, at this point, but we're looking forward to finalizing them so we can put data from the first quarter of the program, of the new program in, and be able to look comparatively at our existing housing program, our existing rapid rehousing programs, and the new McKinney-funded rapid rehousing program that just launched. Um, so we'll be reviewing these these dashboards during our learning circles um, as a means to be able to talk about what folks are experiencing, uh, what challenges there might be in meeting certain benchmarks, and then what we can do differently to change what the outcomes we're seeing are. Um, we can go ahead and flip forward to the next one. So learning circles. Um, we just had our first one this past week. Um, it's a chance for case managers, a contract monitor, and a representative from our local education and employment program. So um, those are education and employment programs that are not necessarily homeless specific, um, but maybe. Um, and so we have someone who comes to be able to talk about the barriers that caseloads are experiencing in either accessing education programs or in increasing their income, um, and talk about other resources that they might be able to engage in. Um, so this is really a time for case managers to um, learn, reflect, support one another in the program efforts, um, have some you know, problem solving for specific issues, talk about different community resources, um, and to talk about creativity. Um, that's been huge so far. So you know, when we first launched the program back in August, we said, and be creative. And people said, what does that mean? Um, so so far, what that has looked like is talking about um, the range of uh, living situations that someone can uh, move forward with through the Rapid Rehousing Program. Um, for one example, we had a case manager who shared that her client has never 
lived in housing before, that this is his first time renting um, and being on his own. And so she took him to look at the apartment, so like studio dorm style living, um, that it's a slightly less expensive option to live in a really desirable area. Um, studio apartments, shared houses, talking about what the different opportunities could be. Another option that we have with rapid rehousing is that if someone has room in their home, um, then, and all it takes is the young person to be able to pay rent to live there, so a family member or a friend, then the young person can use the rapid rehousing money and subsidy to be able to pay to live with that person. Um, so there's a lot of options and so being able to talk about those and, and being able to bolster those relationships. Um, one case manager had two young people referred to her and those two young people were staying in the same shelter. So once they first realized that they had both gotten referred to the same housing program, they decided to live together so that they could have more space, afford a larger apartment, and have the support of one another as they found housing. Um, so kind of ongoing learning questions as we move forward, um, thinking a lot about what support do young people need while they're in housing. Um, are we giving enough? Are we giving too much? Are we cutting off the rental subsidies at an appropriate time? Um, and how successful are people once we've done that? Are people turning back because they need you know, a one month of um, emergency assistance? Or are people returning to homelessness within that year after they've ex actually exited the program? Um, looking at stability in a challenging housing market, um, are we looking at all of the options? Are there other things that we're not thinking of? Um, and then also alignment with other population groups. Right now, I mean, even within the young adult community, we have four or five different models of rapid rehousing-ish programs. Um, and then that doesn't even take into account the families and the single adults. And so when we say, oh, rapid rehousing, people say, well, which one do you mean? Um, so looking at aligning that. So when we say rapid rehousing, it's understood across the community what that is. And maybe there's a couple of distinctions for population subgroups, but overall it is the same core philosophy of housing. Um, so those are things that we've got uh, in the mix and, and moving forward. We're excited to see where it goes. And that's all I've got. Great. Thank you so much, Samantha. And, um, and kudos to all of the All Home team, um, including uh, folks who aren't there anymore. Um, but I know all of you have been working like nonstop um, to improve the youth homelessness system in King County. And um, just in the two and a half years that I've been here at the Alliance, just it's been cool to see so much progress um, there. So next up we have um, Kay Mosher McDivitt from the Alliance Capacity Building Team to kind of wrap it all up for us about taking a systems approach um, to homelessness and how rapid rehousing really fuels that approach. And if I can make sure that I am unmuting Kay. I unmuted myself, so we're good. Oh, good. <laughs> Kay takes charge, people. <laughs> <laughs> Just of myself. So hello, everybody. Um, as Mindy said, I'm Kay Mosher McDivitt. And um, I do a lot of training uh, around the rapid rehousing model. So um, one of the things that I normally do when I'm on a webinar is I like to write my notes so I can say focus on what I want to say. But today what I really wanted to do was really follow behind where, you know, Joyce's presentation and then Samantha and Margaret's presentation and and then think about how to bring it together. So I have to tell you that as they were talking, I am furiously scribbling things um, and notes on things that I want to sort of bring back to when we talk about this systemic rapid rehousing. And I think the one thing I want to say is that I think Margaret first said it, she said we had a lot of stuff that was rapid rehousing-ish. And I think that is the piece that when we really think about, you know, how do we think about this systemically, it's just incredibly important that number one, that our system to end homelessness has a rapid rehousing, a very robust rapid rehousing as part of it, because we know that the one solution to end homelessness is housing, and rapid rehousing does that. But then, even when we have that, what we know is that a lot of times, there's a lot of rapid rehousing-ish stuff going on, and, and sometimes those folks may have funding specifically that's called rapid rehousing funding, other times they may not. But there tends to be in communities when there's not this systemic way of looking at rapid rehousing, stuff tends to tend to be all over the place, and then what we even find, I mean, 
I, I hate to use this term, but we even have heard communities say that we've got people that are like program shopping. I don't want to go to that rapid rehousing program. I want to go to that rapid rehousing program because nobody's doing anything in the same way. And that really is, it, it's a huge disservice to us because we aren't learning from each other. It's a huge disservice to our community because they can't figure out what the heck we're talking about when it comes to recruiting landlords or explaining the program or getting funding. You know, we find that funders often um, don't even have a clear understanding if we're looking at funding beyond the federal funding that comes down. And most programs do have alternative sources of funding because you can't just use one source to make it happen. Um, and then to the folks that we serve, you know, um, because this term is being used so broadly, it's just really important to talk about the same thing. So, Mindy, next slide. So, I tend to use, I'd like to use this slide a lot um, when I do um, rapid rehousing training, and it, it, and I want to think about it. And so, for, say for example, I'd be you know in D.C. and I'd say Washington D.C. rapid rehousing in the center. And for the purpose of today, I just took that out. But I try to get communities to think think about. It doesn't even matter where your funding comes from or the populations you serve. There's basic things that make rapid rehousing rapid rehousing, and the communities need to start there. And that's exactly when you listen to what Samantha was talking about, like the, all those iterations of what rapid rehousing looked like, and there were all kinds of different eligibility requirements and everybody sort of was doing their own thing and then the process by coming together and saying this is what rapid rehousing is and then we think of those other things as funding sources. I've been in communities that say, oh, I don't do you know, consumer care rapid rehousing, I do ESG rapid rehousing. What rapid rehousing should be rapid rehousing, not just a bunch of different funding sources. And I think it also comes into play with populations we serve that there's some basic components that no matter who you serve, they matter and they go into place um, and and I think the main thing we know is that you know the rapid rehousing model is it's not a one-size-fits-all program and so it, it's individualized and not every youth it, you know, looks exactly the same, and not every family looks the same, and not every single looks the same. And so, what works for one household is not going to work for another household. What works for one family is not going to work for another family. What um, what works for one youth is not what's going to work for another youth. So, the the main thing in this to get started is you've got to have those basic components in place and say this is what rapid housing is, regardless of the funding, and then. Um, Bring those programs together and help them to understand that when you when you work with an individual within those parameters, it can still be individualized. It's not that you do you know say okay, well our program is everybody's going to get exactly this much of money, and then when it's over, it's over, and then they leave. And I think from even Margaret's study of what she saw is that when you have different programs, that just by having different program models, it can you know potentially um, have an impact on the outcome of what happens in those programs because if a program has a standard that after six months everything goes away no matter what, then you know you may have more folks that don't stay in that housing. Um, or if you have a program that requires people to do certain things that before they get into housing, you may have that. So it's really going to be important then um, that you really look at what are those core that core philosophy of what you want your community's rapid rehousing intervention to look like. Um, and so that rapid rehousing is just that. It's about rapidly rehousing persons to end their homelessness. And it's going to help everyone in your community really have a clear vision of what rapid rehousing is. So the next slide. And then you're going to have to do a bunch of little clicks here because I put too much on okay. one slide. So the first slide. I got it. <laughs> so I a lot of a lot of us have heard about the collective impact model. And the collective impact model has five basic areas. And I'm going to talk about that because when you think about that, this is going to help you think about how rapid rehousing can be systemic within your community. So first of all, you need to have a common agenda around anything. The, the concept, if you haven't heard of collective impact, is that when everybody collectively comes together and has these uh, these five components that collectively really changes what happens. It's a, a, a much larger changing force. So it's really important to have a common agenda. So the common agenda is that 
you know, homelessness is the problem with the solution, and that's housing. So regardless of our populations, whether we're youth providers, whether we're family providers, it's important to know that how, you know, and, and all agree that housing is a solution, permanent housing is a solution. And then, and that rapid rehousing is a necessary part of community solution bed homelessness. And so you start there so that there doesn't, isn't this back and forth about should we do it or shouldn't we do it, but that the community as a whole, regardless of the population, embraces the philosophy that homelessness can be solved with permanent housing and rapid rehousing is a necessary component of our system to make that happen. The next one. So now here's where it gets into, you know, more specific then. So you need to have shared measurement systems. So, and again, that's for any collective impact model. But what does that mean under rapid rehousing? Is that every program, regardless of who you're serving, regardless of your funding, um, uh, your funding source that you really need to have the same benchmarks to measure your effectiveness. So Joyce talked about the systemic benchmarks, and these are the same benchmarks. Um, well, and then Margaret talked about also looking at the local programs and seeing where they hit those benchmarks. So if you aren't aware, the Alliance um, released in February, I think. Um, Jen, you can kick in if, if I'm wrong, but in February of this year, we released some standards that were um, put together in in collaboration with APT and also were signed often by HUD, by the VA, and, um, and USICH. And so those standards have specific benchmarks, and Margaret alluded to those benchmarks um, about you know, what shows what a good rapid rehousing is. So every program should be looking at those benchmarks. And those benchmarks are the, you know, the rates of exit from the program into permanent housing, the rates of return, and the length of time it takes. And having those dashboards and those benchmarks that King County is talking about is just a really critical element to make sure that that happens. So again, it, you know, Joyce mentioned those in her presentation and had those listed there that part of the work that they did in D.C. was looking at those areas and how important those are. And then the next one is the mutually reinforcing um, activities. And if you haven't had the opportunity to be on all of these webinars with the Learning Collaborative, the one of the things that has happened is there's three core components that again have been signed off on by all of the you know organizations that I just mentioned. Um, and and those are the housing identification component, the financial assistance component, and the rapid rehousing case management component. And all those core components need to be part of every program and they need to be, just as King County said, that this is the way eligibility looks and this is how we do it. it you know, so that you know, you don't have one program that's doing things one way and doing things another one. What we know is independent programming is just not nearly as effective. Um, and I think it comes back to, again, that term about you know, the rapid rehousing issue and, and that there were lots of um, differences among the programs. So part of the work that both Joyce and, you know, and Margaret, you know, worked on is, you know, in those communities, as you look at all of these things, you, you find that when people aren't using those same activities in the same way, then it, we're not even sure if we're really talking about rapid rehousing. So it's just going to be incredibly important to all use those. And then, you know, uh, Samantha gave me the lead and right to this one, commun continuous communication. So rapid rehousing pro providers need to stay connected, making sure they're messaging the same agenda and activities. So the learning circles is a perfect model of how you can make that work. And here's what's, what we really know is that we're seeing in communities that, that regardless of populations you serve, you can really learn from each other. Um, the shared housing solution for a lot of communities came out of um, folks that were um, single adults. We, you know, first started hearing about shared housing with single adults, um, particularly communities that were really using it to take street outreach into rapid rehousing and finding that they would find a group of individuals that were staying together outside and they would, they didn't want to leave sort of that community they had built up and they found that by finding housing to keep those folks together in a shared housing situation, they were able to be much more successful. So we can learn from each other. We may serve different populations, but coming together on a regular basis, you know, whether you call it a learning circle or a learning community or a rapid rehousing club, it is really important that you come together and talk to each other to make sure that you are using the mutually reinforcing activities, that you're using the shared measurements, and that you're really learning from each other. So, you know, thanks for sharing that on the learning circles because that really helps. 
And then there needs to be the backbone support organization. And that's where the folks like um, the, with King County being on here, the continuum of care has the staff that can support these processes that you know follow the benchmarks that can give feedback and look at it. So when you think about this, as you look at this in your communities and, and look to, to really improving your rapid rehousing for use, really look at your larger system and, and look what you can do to become part of that and take this back to them. Next slide. So I just put these in again, and I just mentioned them. The, the best practice standards for core, um, core components across the providers. And um, I know that some of the questions that we saw came in talked about, you know, how do you find landlords that will rent to um, use, particularly if they've never had housing before, or how do you find their shared housing situations? How do you do financial assistance to make this work? Um, and, and what we know is that by making this individualized, that having, you know, having tons of different types of housing resources available, um, having different individualized ability to help folks, you, you know, sort of the progressive engagement, not sort of, I told Mindy already I use that term sort of when I can't get my words out quickly enough, but I don't mean sort of <laughs> using a progressive engagement model where you start with a light touch assistance and you don't just assume that because you know you have certain demographics that you're going to need X, Y, and Z. You start with where the person's at and you then move from there. And some folks may be able to, to do really well with just a little bit of assistance. You know, we've seen people, even young adults, be able to do well with a couple months of assistance. They just need to get on their feet and once they get out of the, the homeless system on their feet, they just like they take off, right? That independence kicks in and they do really well. And there's someone else that we may think is going to do really well and we get them into housing and we just find that tons of stuff come up along the way and we find they may, may need something more. But there's no tool from the front end that can tell us that. So if you click again, you're going to see this little thing that comes up. It's never a one-size-fits-all program. Mindy went too fast. It was supposed to be just that little thing that came up. Is that you really need to, as you think of this, that you use the best practice standards for each core component, which are out there. There's been webinars on them across the system. But then within that is that you look at each person individually. Um, and then you're going to see a lot more success. And that's when the benchmarks, you know, meeting the benchmarks that we talked about, those measure, shared measurement standards, will start getting closer if you come below that. So the next one. So I'm just going to end by saying that I think, again, you know, even in a systemic approach to rapid rehousing is that we often will be in communities where you have, you know, eight, nine, ten different rapid rehousing providers. And, you know, and they, they you know, might even come to meetings together, right? Um, and they, you know, they talk to each other. But, but they still have their own unique nuances, and nobody's sort of ready to give that in. Well, you know, my program is a three-month program, or my program, you know, only serves people that look like this, and my program has these eligibility standards because we think that that's the best. So they're talking to each other, um, and they're in the clock shop, and we feel pretty good about that. But what we want to suggest is, next slide, Mindy, or next click, is that you're one clock, right, and that each of you now, now she's clicking through too quickly. There we go. <laughs> that each of you is a gear in that clock, right? And so those gears have to connect together. And to keep the rapid rehousing system clock ticking, that everybody knows what that clock looks like. And, it's, and so when we're talking to landlords, they're not getting confused because one program is doing something and one program is doing something else. They get it. And when we're talking to our funders, that they understand what they're funding. And when we're talking to um, those that we serve, those that we're um, providing rapid rehousing to, they understand what the program's all about. We've got to keep that those gears connected, interlocked, working together and oiled. So, you know, I just encourage you to go back and be a rapid rehousing clock in your community. Um, regard, you know, if you're going to just start this for the first time, really be looking at what's happening in your system and start aligning it um, and having those learning circles to come together so that you can keep that systemic approach going. So now it's Mindy's turn. Great. Thank you so much, Kay. Um, thanks for always for sharing your wisdom and expertise um, with us. Uh, and thanks again to all of our presenters. Um, we'll now have an opportunity uh, for them to take your questions. And I've gotten so many awesome questions already. Um, I'm going to try to uh, 
sort through them and, and get to as many of them as we can. Um, you can continue to enter questions in the box to your right. Um, and I do know that uh, Joyce, unfortunately, is going to have to drop off um, uh, at 4 o'clock. So I want to get um, a question or two to you, Joyce, before we lose okay. you. And thank you again for taking the time. Um, a few folks had a question. Um, about, uh, could you talk some more about what systemic impacts are that you're going to expect to see either in DC or I know you know you do TA in lots of places. So, like systemic impacts that you expect to see for youth homelessness um, specifically as communities increase in investment in rapid rehousing for youth. Well, so the system performance measures are measured for, you know, all people in a community that eventually COCs will have reports that break it out by subpopulation. But right now when they're generating the system performance measures includes every person who um, has touched a program that enters data into HMIS. So, uh, you know, changing youth programs to include more rapid rehousing, that's uh, that may not move that system performance number on length of stay that much, but as you start looking at it by subpopulation, ideally you establish a baseline for the length of time homeless for youth, and the goal would be to reduce that time because, uh, as Kay said, you know, the solution to, or to homelessness is housing and uh, rapid rehousing achieves that. Um, so I think from a systemic point of view, um, where the main concern is reducing the trauma of homelessness for anybody, including youth, um, getting people into their own homes and then supporting them in their homes, uh, rapid rehousing achieves that. And obviously a youth rapid rehousing program needs to look a little different than a family or a single adult rapid rehousing program, but I think, you know, everything that we've heard today um, shows that it is possible to design a successful program. So I think really that is the, from a systemic point of view, it's going to reduce the length of time homeless, it's going to increase exits to permanent housing, and hopefully it reduces returns because um, the services in the housing have helped stabilize that youth, put them on the path to employment that helps them maintain their housing and that, you know, the developmental work that they didn't get to do with their family for whatever reason, they're supported in doing it, um, you know, in the program and with the connections that the program has helps them establish. And that they really never return to homelessness, right? Like ultimately that is the our ultimate goal, right? That the experience of youth homelessness does not determine the rest of their life. Awesome. Thank you, Joyce. Um, and another question that I'll put to you and then um, uh, probably would want to hear from the rest of the panelists too. Um, are there other ideas that uh, that you have, having done the systems work that you've done for so long, um, about additional outcomes that systems uh, should be capturing? I mean, I know there are the HUD performance measures, but some. Do you have other ideas about additional outcomes that a system would want to capture to improve the system response to youth homelessness? Well, I think, you know, the dashboards that King County showed are really like where systems should be looking. That Those kind of process um, outcomes, how long it takes to house somebody. I would also be interested in how long it takes from the first time the person is identified to when they're referred to the program because that's a different length of time than how long they're referred, you know, enrolled in the program to house. You know, those are process outcomes to see how effective your coordinated entry process is and um, your rapid rehousing program. So, um, you know, I think it all kind of ties back to the same questions, but you can make it more granular to see how different parts of your system is functioning. And I'm sorry, but I am going to have to drop off in a couple of okay. minutes because I have to start the call. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for taking your time, Joyce, um, to be with oh, us today. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to share it with you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we also had some questions. Um, let's see. I kind of I had a lot of questions about progressive engagement. And um, uh, King County folks, 
Um, I know that uh, you mentioned progressive engagement a little, but before I get to the specifics about uh, what's happening with King County, Kay, can you tell us about just um, some examples uh, from your experience um, in working around the country of where progressive engagement is being implemented kind of at that systems level and uh, what the impact it's had has been? Yeah. So, and, and I think, again, what we, um, so, so many times, you know, we want sort of this perfect definition for what this is and what are the specifics of what we need to do. And so, you know, even with rapid rehousing, when you, when you think about what, what is rapid rehousing, well, rapid rehousing is exactly what we say. It's about rehousing somebody rapidly, right? Sometimes we think people forget the rapid part of it, um, and I think that's, that's exactly what Samantha was talking about, you know, at that front end, looking at all those things and making sure it's rapid. So it's sort of the same with progressive engagement. Like, if you think about what those words mean, you know, sort of progressively engaging, it's, it's sort of turning away, you know, the idea that, you know, program has A, B, C, and D, and everybody gets A, B, C, and D. Um, and, and then when A, B, C, and D end, the program is over. The progressive engagement model is it's more of a progressive, instead of over-engaging at the front end and then just cutting everybody off, it's like a progressive amount. Because what we know and what we've seen around the country is that um, no matter you know, what scoring tool we've used, no matter what um, assessment needs assessment we have, no matter what housing barrier somebody presents with, no matter what somebody looks like on paper, is that we can't, we just aren't able to measure things like somebody's problem solving ability, somebody's resiliency, somebody's tenacity, somebody's creative solutions. Um, and what we find is that just the, the event of homelessness versus the event of housing can just make such an impact on how people respond. And so how somebody responds and how they they look at their needs when they're in the homeless system is homeless um, and are feeling sort of hopeless a lot of times versus how they feel when they're empowered with housing. We find that sometimes the housing alone um, is what somebody needed and not all of the supports that we thought they needed when we saw them in the shelter system. On the other hand, we can see, you know, it can also go in the other way that somebody comes in and, and it feels like when we talk to them that everything's really together and all they need is just a little tiny bit of something, but then, I said this before, when they get in, we don't know. So the idea is that you don't start at the beginning making an assumption and making this package plan of, you know, when we, if we work with youth of a certain age that look like a certain, you know, population and have certain issues, then they're going to need this. But rather we start with just where, what do they need to get out of shelter into housing and what are those supports that they've identified they need that we can start connecting them with and, and encircling them with. And, you know, we've seen some programs that will sort of put these things like, okay, what do you need for the next two to three months and start there? We see programs that are doing it on a month-by-month -month basis. Jacksonville, Florida, they're doing it on a month-by-month -month basis. They just start out with one month, and they don't make a determination of what people need for three months or six months. Um, they start with one month, and because the case managers are there working with them, that that plan, that stability, that housing, you know, that constant conversation is like, you know, so what's next month going to be look like, and what are you doing to keep your housing? Those conversations, so it, it, that you become more engaged. You know, in other words, you become more engaged by for people that need more, you know, deeper things. That you'll know that the longer you work with them, you won't know that from the beginning. And what we find from programs, Salt Lake City, as an example, we use that all the time, is that what they find is that you know the you know the the largest number of people only need you know about three months of assistance. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a, then out of that next group, another, you know, they, they look at, you know, and they find that, you know, for about six months and uh, the next largest group just need another three months of assistance. And then what they find, there's only a very small percentage of people that need something deeper at the end of nine months. Um, and, you know, but then you have to have those resources. You know, are there, a, is there a PSH slot? Is there a long-term subsidy? Something comes up that they, they, but it's sort of almost like the system of engagement is more self-selective by the, the needs of the clients, not from some assessment tool um, or needs assessment from the beginning. I, I hope that yeah, that with makes more sense. clarification than than just no, that was so, great, and okay. that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so now that we have kind of uh, that larger picture about progressive engagement, I wonder if um, Samantha and um, Margaret, if you um, want to chime in on this too. So one of the things that uh, 
that uh, some folks thought was interesting is uh, the data that you had that um, three quarters of uh, the folks who stayed in the program for less than six months exited to a permanent destination. Um, and so I, I think those uh, observations kind of lend to thinking about progressive engagement, um, that you had a whole lot of people who actually didn't need um, what, uh, what, what I've heard across the country has been kind of like the average intervention in rapid rehousing for youth that you need to, like nine months to a year. Um, but you had pretty good outcomes for a big chunk of people that were, that were getting assistance for less than six months. So do you guys want to talk about just kind of um, what that finding uh, said to you, particularly, Samantha, as the system, right? Like how you're going to develop your system response based on that, that information. Before Samantha jumps in, can I just clarify a little bit the, sure. about that data? So I think one thing that's worth noting on that is that one of the programs that was in the analysis specifically just had their, the program limit length limit was six months. And that program also had a minimum income requirement of $1,000. Um, and so I think it is... You know, I wasn't able to parse everything in this analysis, so I do think it's worth noting that probably most of those clients who stayed six months or less, a, a good number of them probably also came in with a higher amount of income. Um, so those things are entangled together. Okay, great. Yeah. And I think that's part of what happens in every community that you're going to have, and, and that's kind of what progressive engagement does, right, is you have everybody coming in, and, um, and then it kind of sorts itself out who's able to do a little and who needs a lot. Samantha? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, knowing that there's different expectations in all of our programs, but also I think sometimes people will take what they can get. And so if you come in knowing that it's going to be six months of rental assistance, you're going to do everything that you need to do, and the case manager is going to potentially work with the young person in a different way, knowing that it's a very short rental subsidy before they're expected to maintain that unit. And so I, I, that's been some of our thinking behind our new McKinney-funded program is saying, well, yeah, we can technically give 24 months of assistance, but you know, really we want the message to be 12 months, and really, even beyond that, it's whatever the person needs. So I think, you know, it's, I think of it kind of in correlation with, um, like there's some shelter programs that don't give any timeline for how long someone can stay in their shelter. And there's other shelters, um, a program up in Northern Virginia particularly that comes to mind that says, as soon as someone moves into shelter says, your exit date is 30 days from now. What are we going to do to get you out of here within those 30 days? And so I think that that's the approach that we want this, these programs to take is what will it take to get you off of this assistance as soon as possible and what do you need to get there? And if you've had housing before and you've lost that housing, what can we do to try and prevent that from happening again and how will you respond if it does happen again so that you don't lose your housing as a result of it? So, you know, some of that advanced problem solving um, and just looking at what community resources and supports would be available to someone should they no longer be receiving the subsidy, but so that they can maintain their housing in the future. Um, so I think it's really, you know, it has to be client-centered and it has to be fast, but also working with them proactively to get and obtain their housing without this preconceived idea that it is going to last for some amount of time because chances are a lot of people don't need as long as we think they do. I think a lot of people right. will surprise us. We need to give them that chance. Great. Thank you. Um, and I will let everyone know, so we're scheduled to go until 4.30 and, um, and I will still try to get to, um, I have a few slides on the youth homelessness demo, but we had so many questions um, for these systems folks and I want to be able to, to make sure that we get as many of those questions answered as possible. So I might have to either breeze through my demo slides or just send those out to you um, all as a group later. Um, so I had another, um, this is an interesting question. I hadn't thought about this before. Um, and Kay, you can talk about this uh, potentially from other communities that you've been in. Um, but I'd also love to hear from you guys in King County um, because you talked about having a, a single housing locator for the whole cohort. So we had questions about working with landlords at a systems level. 
rather than at a program level. Um, you know, we've had individual programs on the learning community thus far talk about the work that they do with landlord engagement as part of the first core component. Um, but what's the difference in that and doing landlord work at a systems level? Kay, do you want to just kick us off with an overview? So, yeah. So, um, so yes. I, so I think what the this is why it's so important when we talk about rapid rehousing. The the only way you can do it from a, you know a system to have a community, um, you know, landlord um, housing identifier, um, housing locator. There's all kinds of titles that are used for them. But the only way it's going to work on a system level is if you have a system approach to rapid rehousing because again um, then you're going out and you're 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 recruiting landlords and you're recruiting landlords and you're finding out sort of what's a good fit for this landlord you know is this a landlord that really understands um, certain things and, and we talked about that in the youth housing identification like you know are these landlords that are you know, used to renting to to um, young folks. Um, are they landlords that were considered a shared housing arrangement? And so you have to be able to do that and sort of have this whole menu that meets the different needs of all the rapidly housing people in the community. So it really takes a very special person that talks landlord language, really is able to find out what's you know what's what works for landlords, and then be able to you know sort of specify. Okay, these are landlords that work really well with singles. These are good family landlords. These are good you know landlords that are going to work well with you know. People people with mental illness, the, you know, just doing that. But the only way it's going to work is if you've got a program model that everybody's using that when you go out and talk to landlords, you're talking the same thing. Um, on the individual level, um, what can happen is when you have a ton of individual programs, the, you know, the disadvantage of having a ton of individual programs go out and do all their own landlord recruitment is on the same day, you know, um, if, if, you know, we hear that landlords have, you know, some units coming on, um, and now you've got like, you know, 10 programs calling the same landlord. And now you talk about landlord confusion, right? Like, well, somebody just called me about this rapid rehousing program. Wasn't it you? Um, and we actually, I saw that happen in practice when we were doing a rapid rehousing learning collaborative in Northern Virginia. Um, and we had a break, and um, and after the break, three people came back in from three different um, rapid rehousing providers and realized that they had all talked to the same landlord during that break to one of their clients. So, you know, those are the risks that you take that, you know, even if you sort of think, well, I'm getting my own landlords, is that other people are looking for them too. There's not, nobody has a whole menu of landlords that are out there that are just, you know, like, you know, come on, you know, I need I need people in my house. You know, almost every community is dealing with um, low vacancy rates. We're dealing with high rents. Um, and so, you know, landlord recruitment is a really special thing. So coming back to a system perspective is important. I've seen this work in communities where there's not like one or, you know, one or two housing locators for the whole system, but it's done on the program level. But, but the way it's being done, and um, an example would be, um, in, in Fairfax, Virginia, and the way they do it is that each organization has an individual that that's their job, and those, and there, I forget how many programs they have, six, seven, those six or seven housing locators get together on a weekly basis and strategize, you know, who's going to do what and how they're going to do it. Um, so they're selling, then that way they can sell their agency and sort of their agent, you know, what their agency is doing, but they're still talking the exact same language because they have a systemic approach to rapid housing. So that would Great. be the way I would talk about it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Kay. Um, and so for Samantha and Margaret, um, how are you guys thinking about putting that um, landlord engagement as a systems approach into um, what you're doing on youth homelessness? I know, I know, as I mentioned, you talked about having a single housing locator for the entire cohort of programs. Yeah, so I can go ahead and start with that. Um, so we do have the housing locator based at one of the four receiving agencies that are doing the rapid rehousing for this program. Um, so it's really up to her to be developing relationships. It is in a very siloed way, the same that, that you just spoke about. So. Um, you know, she has her relationships with landlords, doesn't necessarily talk with other housing locators or other programs, and is just very narrowly um, working with 
this rapid rehousing program. So, um, you know, she's developing good faith letters and developing relationships, reaching out and trying to explain the benefits of this particular program. And I can definitely see how that may become confusing when looked at in conjunction with the other competing programs in our community. Um, as far as developing the system response, though, we did just re recently release uh, an RFP in our community for um, essentially landlord liaison. And that was a program that um, was previously existing, was held by a local nonprofit, did great work of connecting um, all people um, who applied to this program with affordable housing that meet their needs. And so we have this kind of LLP 2.0 that will be coming on board sometime in early 2017. And I think that that's where we're going to be getting that systems approach. And that person will have to develop a relationship with our housing locator so that they can share resources and, and take advantage of what the work that one another is doing. Um, so I think we need to develop that system response and that will only make the system work better. And in the meantime, we're just kind of piecemealing what we can along to try and help the housing search component um, of our new rapid rehousing program. Great, thank you, that's exciting. Um, yeah. We had some, uh, for King County, very specific questions. Um, here's a, just a really easy one. Uh, folks wanted to know what product you used for your dashboard. You know, I don't know either. Um, it's all data that <laughs> I is think, found I think in they're using HMIS. Yeah, go ahead, Margaret. I think they're using Tableau. Oh, wow. I've seen so many cool things with Tableau. Apparently, we all need to become experts in Tableau. <laughs> OK. Um, and Samantha, if you find out later that it's a, it's a different specific product, just let me know, and I can email the community. Um, Definitely, but that sounds right, Margaret. OK. Um, so a lot of folks also, uh, as as we talked about um, during your presentation, Margaret, uh, that there, there's this um, this group of young people who have been enrolled in rapid rehousing but never made it to moving in stage. Um, so I had mm -hmm. several questions around that, and um, uh, some of that was about uh, who are these young people? Do you have data on them? Do you know where they go? Do they eventually come back? Um, and then uh, some other questions were around um, what are recommendations or ideas that you guys have as a community about how to keep those young people engaged so that they don't um, miss the move-in part. Yeah. So unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> within the scope of this analysis, there wasn't, I wasn't able to dig into them a lot. Um, but I'm looking back through, I actually have a 63 slide version of that deck um, that I'm just trying to look back through right now to get a sense of whether or not I had any more information. Um, so a few things. I mean, income was correlated with likelihood of moving in. Um, so, you know, those with higher income were more likely to move in than those who didn't. Um, so that is one thing to note about those who didn't end up moving in. Um, there wasn't, uh, there was also, those who were in shelter or literally homeless were also slightly less li likely to move into housing um, than those who, so let's see, 74% of those who were coming from an emergency shelter, literally homeless situation, moved into housing, 26% exited without move-in. Um, one thing that was interesting is that um, at least one or two of the um, housing programs, the rapid rehousing-ish programs, was that they were part of a, an organization's housing continuum, and so they were sometimes designed for young adults moving out of transitional housing programs and on to more independent living situations. And right. so there was a portion of um, young adults in the analysis who were coming out of transitional housing programs. But it was interesting to see that even if they were coming out of a transitional housing program, still 21% of them didn't move into housing within the rapid rehousing program. 79% of them did, but anyways, um, and uh, we did not see any difference in race or age in terms of likelihood of moving in. Um, 
so that was kind of an important finding for us. We wanted to make sure that like youth of color weren't, you know, um, failing at higher rates than right. young adult than white young adults. Um, but you know, in talking to case managers in the programs, I think this is where one of my recommendations about being sure to set up clear expectations at the beginning of a program is that. You know, rapid rehousing for young adults that's never lived on their own before may be kind of challenging. You know, they've got to go out and be an active lead, you know, and it depends on the type of housing program, but, you know, they need to lead their housing search, and um, that's a pretty big job. And so, you know, I think some young people who were referred to rapid rehousing, case managers felt like maybe they weren't really prepared for that part of what the program was going to involve, mm -hmm. and didn't have, um, you know, they would say they didn't have the motivation to make it through the housing search part, um, but I think this is a question, too, of raising of, you know, what support is necessary for young people to be successful in rapid rehousing. Does that help answer yeah, the and question I, at all? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, can and I, I jump? Bring, let me jump. Oh, sorry, Mindy, I was just hey, going to jump in a little bit. No, I might yeah. actually be uh, about to say what you were going to say, which is okay, that, okay. Uh, you know, just uh, some people need help in the housing search, and, and I think that's one mm -hmm. of the inconsistent, inconsistencies across rapid rehousing programs around the country is that um, some programs just say, you know, here's the one ad, find something, and other programs, like, my job is to help you find something, um, and and obviously some people do need more help. Okay, yeah. is that going to cover it? And, <laughs> yeah, well, and I was, and I was, also, I was, that was one thing I was going to say, again, sort of that individualized approach. And I think, again, it, so it's not like this is the program and you've got to fit into my program model, but rather, you know, we have these three areas, core components, and we're going to tweak each of those in order to make sure that, that you, you know, that we're the most, you know, we're doing what we need to do for your individual situation. So it's, again, being individualized. Um, and in the, you know, in the early, in the early years of rapid rehousing, you know, through HPRP, we sort of found similar kinds of things um, that you're talking about with the youth, you know, with programs that were just starting up or, you know, had not had long-term experience and, and like being completely embraced in the rapid rehousing model is it, sort of that, you know, the, like some folks would just sort of, you know, like disappear and we weren't even sure where they went. But what we, when, you know, on my on the personal level in the community I worked with before I worked with the Alliance, we started really looking at it. And a lot of times we found what we were offering is not what they needed. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think the thing, again, you know, you talked about this um, really well, both of you did, was the thing with, you know, with youth is that not every youth is ready to be out on their own. I mean, this is not just about homeless youth. I know I know tons of youth in this age group um, that are living with family and friends and, and would never make it on their own regardless of their situation just because we're not ready to be that independent yet. So I think that's the other thing that's really important to look at is that, you know, we see tons of, you know, kids who go to college and come home and live, you know, with parents or family and friends. Um, and most of us, you know, upon graduating from high school, you know, or even college, you know, didn't have our own apartment to ourselves. We just, I didn't. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think we have to remember that, right? And not go, oh, you know, and so that independence is that, you know, my, my own um, grandson isn't, you know, at age 21 ready to be in his own place. Um, so I think that's some of the stuff to just remember in all of this. It is not just yeah. about, you know, the homeless piece, but, you know, the, 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 it's sort of the fidelity of the rapid rehousing model to be individualized. And I think you all agree you. that to me came through in the, in the study, when you look at it, is that not every program even had the same way of doing things, which also led to some, you know, perhaps some differences. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That also uh, brings me to another question for King County. Um, uh, Samantha, you guys talked about um, that there's a portion of young people who do um, uh, end up living with friends and family, and, and like Kay said, a lot of people don't live on their own in the country. Um, I had roommates well into my 40s, actually, because I lived in really expensive cities. Um, so what are you, you talked about when the young people are living with their friends and family and you're using um, rapid rehousing dollars for that. What is, uh, this is a really specific question from one of the participants, what is the lease arrangement um, that you're using to fund that with rapid rehousing dollars? Yeah, so what I can definitely speak to is the programs that we've had around for the past um, 
five-ish years um, because the new program is so new and we are just in the, the first stages of people signing leases and moving in. So I can talk about what we've designed that to look like um, okay, great. should someone want to move forward with that. So um, for other situations though, um, you know, the young person's name needs to be on a lease and the program subsidy, the rental subsidy, would only go toward that person's share of the rent. So let's say that someone has found a roommate, has a friend that they want to move in with, the rent is $2,000. Their portion would be considered $1,000 and the rental subsidy would be used towards that $1,000 portion. Um, so that's what it is for existing programs. That's the same for someone, you know, whether that other person is a friend, um, a significant other, the rental subsidy is only used for half of the rent in that situation um, or for the, the participant's share of the rent. Um, in the new program, what it's set up since like living with a family member is even an option or someone who has an existing um, home and has a room for that person to move into. The young person's name, again, needs to be on the lease. It needs to be a 12-month lease or unless a mutual termination is agreed on. Um, and then, you know, whatever the individual sets as rent for that unit. Um, so, I mean, of course, within the guidelines of what is acceptable under um, our local allotments. But, you know, as long as there's a lease and, and that young person wants to move into that space, then we can support that with the rental subsidy. Great, thank you. Um, and I have, um, I'll have one more question and then just try to blow through my demo slides. Um, and um, Samantha, if you have some ideas about this, um, definitely contribute, but this might end up being one for K, uh, just about rural communities. So people like the idea of the learning circles um, and they're wondering how you could make a learning circle work in a rural area where everybody can't get together every week over coffee. Um, yeah, so I mean, ours has been in person. I wonder, Kay, if you have more that you want to elaborate on. I would say, you know, even something like this is hugely helpful, doing a call-in session and being able yeah. to talk about, you know, having a set agenda of what you're going to cover. Um, but I think that you can accomplish a lot of the same things over a phone call as well as you would in person. Yeah, right, and we're finding that balance of states are doing something similar. I know in, in, the, in, in Indiana, the Indiana balance of state, is you know sort of calling it like a rapidly housing learning collaborative and, and and it's through a call-in environment or a webinar environment you can also set up like a go-to meeting where then it gives you the actual screen thing so you can actually look at each other um you know and have sort of a meeting the virtual i think you know with today's technology we're finding that often it's done virtually so my suggestion if you're in a rural community i'm assuming you're probably part of a balance of state and perhaps um, contacting your balance of state continuum of care and finding out who some of the other rapid rehousing providers are across the state and you know um, if the about you know see if the balance of state you know the, the folks at that continuum of care would take some lead on putting it together and if not you know be the innovator and reach out to some of those programs you know themselves because if you're feeling that way um, and that you'd like to learn and hear what others are doing I know that others would feel the same way too so you know just find out who are others across the state um, other rural communities that you can maybe get in touch with and, um, you know, and start, I would start with a balanced state because they would know who the rapidly housing providers are in most cases. Great. Thank you, Kay. Um, and thanks again to our panelists, including Joyce, who had to go. Um, thanks, all of you, for attending. Um, I'm going to end the Q&A now and just really quickly go through um, the uh, information about the HUD youth demo, and we will also have more information um, about this in uh, future webinars and blog posts. So, um, I know you've all probably heard about the youth homelessness demo program by now, um, and since the systemic approach to youth homelessness that we've been discussing today is such a vital part of that demo, um, I just wanted to go over it for a bit on the webinar. Um, again, this is just an overview. I'm available to answer questions beyond today as your communities are developing their application. And of course, you can always submit questions to the HUD exchange at any time. Um, and I will be sending out additional resources to the learning community on the demo after this webinar. Um, so plenty, plenty more information available to you moving forward. Um, 
first I just want to talk about, about why the demo is so important, um, especially given our conversation today about rapid rehousing as a systems approach. Um, Congress directed HUD to implement this demonstration to demonstrate how a comprehensive community approach to serving homeless youth can dramatically reduce youth homelessness. Um, so we know from all the progress that we've made on veteran homelessness um, that those achievements uh, we're only able to be done by a systemic approach. Um, as my friend Eva Thibodeau from the Houston COC says, we can't program our way out of this. So no individual programs are going to solve this bigger social problem. Um, and as we've learned thus far in the youth rapid rehousing learning community, the best practices in rapid rehousing um, include connecting young people to mainstream resources, um, to ensure that they not only achieve stability in their own homes, but are able to maintain it after the rapid rehousing assistance ends. Um, so the communities that are chosen to be demonstration sites will be developing coordinated community plans to end youth homelessness, and those plans will necessarily include partnering beyond the COC and its homelessness program. Um, next, what's really important about this demo is that it's designed to spark and test innovation in communities. Um, in their philosophical, systemic, and programmatic approaches to serving homeless youth. And this includes things like um, trying out housing first approaches like rapid rehousing, using harm reduction in serving youth, or developing new approaches for tracking and sharing data. So HUD wants communities to be creative. Um, you guys were talking earlier about being creative with rapid rehousing and developing your systems. Um, and this demonstration will allow communities to uh, get waivers of some COC regulations to achieve those creative goals. Additionally, um, the demonstration project requires that communities have a youth advisory board. It's a threshold requirement for being chosen for the demo. Um, young people with lived experience should be actively involved in the development and implementation of the coordinated community plans. Um, youth advisory boards can be already in existence or developed during the application period, and they have to include at least three youth um, age 24 or under, and at least two of those three youth um, have to have lived experience of homelessness. Another really important part um, of the demonstration project, NOFA, and um, as Joyce mentioned earlier, NOFAs can and should be read, um, like all funding announcements, as a signal of an agency's policy priorities. Um, and in this NOFA, there's a really heavy focus on implementing a housing first approach to youth homelessness. Um, and it's important to note that for purposes of this demonstration, um, even transitional housing can be considered a lowercase housing first. Um, if it's low barrier with no preconditions for entry, um, it has voluntary services, and it works to quickly move youth into permanent housing. Finally, um, really important here, another threshold requirement to be chosen as a demonstration community is that COCs must demonstrate a committed partnership with their local child welfare agency. Um, I don't think, of course, it's any news to any of us that the child welfare system is intimately connected with youth homelessness and with all other forms of homelessness, by the way. Um, so it's obvious we cannot end youth homelessness without the full participation of the child welfare system. And since all of you are already in communities that are embracing the innovative approach of rapid rehousing for youth, I do encourage you all to think about how you can get your community to become a uh, YHDP site. Um, of course, this is going to be a very competitive process. There will be 10 communities chosen from around the country, including four rural communities. Um, the applications and plans and programs funded by the demonstration will be based out of your local continuum of care from HUD. And the COC's collaborative applicant is the one who must do the application. So individual programs can't do this application. Um, but the community that's applying uh, to receive the funding can be a smaller geographic area within the larger COC. Um, so within a big balance of state COC, if you want one or two communities that are close to each other to be counted as the community for the project. Um, more than one community within a COC can apply, but ultimately only one community per COC would be chosen. 
And as far as application requirements go, applicants must demonstrate partnerships with both a youth advisory board and the child welfare system. Those are threshold requirements, so if you don't demonstrate those partnerships, you absolutely will not be considered. And then after the 10 communities are selected, um, they will develop coordinated community plans to prevent and end youth homelessness. HUD will be providing technical assistance to help communities develop those plans. Um, and this can include improving upon already existing plans that your community might have. Um, for example, I know King County has a really uh, great and sophisticated youth homelessness plan. Um, for the plans to be approved by HUD, uh, they have to include the following um, things that you see listed there on the slide. And then, um, Within the uh, plans themselves, uh, the co coordinated community plans have to incorporate uh, the following uh, core principles, which is a commitment to the USICH framework and its core outcomes, um, a commitment to identifying and addressing the needs of special subpopulations of homeless youth, including LGBTQ youth, unaccompanied homeless minors, systems involved youth, trafficked or exploited youth, and pregnant and parenting youth. Um, additionally, uh, following positive youth development and trauma-informed care, housing first approach, um, youth-led, client-driven support, social integration, and youth-appropriate coordinated entry. And um, finally, the, this is the point system. Um, it's uh, 100 points available, and the breakdown is as you see here. There's a lot more information on how these points are broken out in the NOFA itself, which I encourage everyone to read. Um, again, this is for the community application, not for individual projects. Those will be applied for after the 10 communities are selected. Um, so that's just, again, a real quick overview of the demo. You can email me any time to ask additional questions, and we'll be sending out uh, additional resources. And finally, um, our next and final webinar for the learning community um, will be October 20th from 2 to 4 p.m. And what Jen and I would like to know is what you would like to focus on for that final meeting. We've covered a lot of ground on the youth rapidly housing uh, learning community in the past five months, and I do have some ideas about how I'd like to wrap things up, but I also want to get your input. So definitely email me and Jen with your ideas, and we'll work hard to make that happen. Um, thanks again for always being a part of uh, this learning community and for joining us on the webinar and for staying a little late with me today. Um, and thank you all for the incredible work that you do every day for young people experiencing homelessness. Goodbye.